And we've got Sherilyn and Pete Little here for the Gardening Gang. But before we start the Gardening Gang today, Jessie's Girl reminds me of a very important piece of news that, uh, well, shall we say, Sherilyn, rather than me share it, you would like to share it with the audience because I think it's wonderful news. It is lovely news this morning. So Bindi Irwin and her husband Chandler, uh, their little baby girl has arrived on their first wedding anniversary. So beautiful. Lovely news. So it's news. like uh, Bindi's girl. Bindi's girl. And Bindi and, and sort of going a little bit against uh, the Hollywood theme of unusual names, they've named the little girl Grace. Yes. After, yeah, it's a nice traditional name. Grace is after uh, her husband Chandler's great-great-grandmother and middle names are Warrior Irwin uh, as a tribute to her father. So, Ooh. yeah, really That's lovely. A I'm a little bit of... Strong name. It is. Grace Warrior Irwin. Yeah, pal. pal. <laughs> so pal. everybody's doing well and it's lovely. Happy news in the morning. Um, and we know Bindi and the family up there all love now, gardening. I wonder if the baby was born on the bathroom floor like uh, <laughs> one of the princesses had an <laughs> experience during the week. Did you oh. hear about that one? No, I didn't yes, hear about that, that one. that was a big piece of news too. Oh. I'm just trying to think now. I think... I think it was one of Fergie's kids right. had a baby and it was born on the bathroom floor. Oh. They weren't prepared for they it. They weren't prepared, no. I think I can, I can see some photographs here now on the news and it looks like little Grace Warrior Irwin Powell was born in a hospital. <laughs> seven pounds, seven uh, ounces, 20 inches. Lovely. Everybody's happy and doing it well. It wasn't in a zoo. Okay. <laughs> now we're talking about uh, dried flowers today. We are. We're talking about the, the nature of preserving uh, living things mm-hmm. for the future. Mm-hmm. And uh, you've got a couple of thoughts on that because uh, something I don't really have any involvement. I do recall Granny having these things. But uh, in terms of uh, contemporary grannies, like mm-hmm. my wife, wouldn't have a clue how to do this, uh, shall we say, uh, preserving flowers well yeah it's really it's no it's back in fashion again and i even noticed that my hairdressers a couple of months ago they had all displays there and it just started twigging my interest as well as seeing all of these dried flowers it's back it was really really popular in the victorian era then the 1980s and 70s it came back again but they're not your old-fashioned dried flowers and foliage in fact there's a lot more foliage than flowers going on a bit of holy foliage going going on there for our gang listeners. And we're going to look today at how we collect, dry and harvest botanicals so that you can use them in your home, but also how you can grow plants, different plants and flowers that you can grow in your garden to then create beautiful dried flowers and arrangements with. And we'll be talking and like... Leaves. And leaves. And leaves and seed sure. pods. It's amazing. And we're actually talking to a florist and nursery person later in the show about just that, like how to do that and how to put it all together and make them last the longest as well. And of course, we've got all the regular features on today as well. We've got uh, Vicky from Narara Valley Nursery, Lockie. Everyone keeps asking us about Lockie Property Report. That's on in our second hour and that's the Gardening Gang today. And we're talking, seeing the rain has gone and things are drying up, we're talking about drying flowers. So we're going to be talking to somebody from the Coachwood Nursery soon, but in your view, what are the most popular flowers to dry out and to uh, display forever, shall we say? In Australia, we have all of our lovely Australian... We have all our Australian natives, and they're absolutely gorgeous, and they very much uh, are very good for drying as well. They just look good. I think it happens by accident most of the time. We buy ourselves or people buy for us a beautiful bunch of Australian natives. We leave it there and it dries out on its own. And the reason they look so good is because they dry by the evaporation method the best. So there's a few different ways you can dry things. You can hang them up to dry. Uh, You can sort of rest their flower heads on a sieve so that they're supported. You can dry them flat as well. But evaporation works by having the flowers and leaves and plants in a vase with water and simply not topping that water up, just letting it go so that it slowly dries out. And Australian natives do really well because they're drought tolerant 
and that's the way they have to survive for a long time without water so they work better with that evaporation method so that's why we sort of accidentally in our homes uh, a lot of times and I've done it I've bought a nice bunch of natives and then just sort of forgotten about them or gone away and then come back to oh a nicely preserved dried bunch so they're really popular and of course dried roses are popular as well and everlasting daisies the paper daisies that are already dry in a way they actually do have a bit of moisture in them but to our feel and touch that they seem dry so they're popular because they keep their color as well so they are and then things like um status status is the old-fashioned they look like little brooms like purple peat or or they're pink as well oh, yes, okay. remember those they're sort of they look mm-hmm. crispy like paper uh they're very popular too but the thing is anything can be dried it just depends on the method that you use. So anything can really be dried. But you're better off when you're selecting things to go for woodier stems than succulent stems because anything, say, like a gerbera has got a very flexible and very juicy stem as well and they don't dry very well. They'll go all floppy when they dry. You, I mean, it can be done commercially in big freeze-drying sort of machines or slow-drying machines but they still don't hold their form very well. So something, say when we look at um, something like a protea, which is an Australian native, that's actually from South Africa, but people kind of make that mistake. But anyway, it's got a very woody stem. It's like a little tree branch. That's going to dry really, really well. So the same as when we look at leaves, uh, gum leaf branches and things like that, they'll dry really, really well. So that's a few. Well, I've got a technique that we discovered at our place, and only by chance we... Uh, said to a couple of friends of ours, you can stay at our place when we went overseas what, about a year and a half ago. We went for six weeks and they came and looked after the house. And then only quite recently I was going through a drawer that's not used very often and I found a newspaper folded over with a flower in it, dried out. Oh, and I rang them and said, did you guys... Oh, they said, oh, we forgot to tell you about that. We saw this beautiful flower. I think it was a flower or was it a leaf? Mm-hmm. Been a leaf. Anyway, in your uh, garden, and we decided to put it through the uh, the drying process that we use. And, and they put it between a newspaper right. and they flatten it down with a bit of, uh, I think it was a book or yes. something like that. Yes. And now we've got this beautiful uh, dried flower. Yep. It just appeared in our drawer. There you How go. About that? And that's Happy it. Days. Yeah, there you go. And that's by using pressing methods, so that would have pressed it out. That's the it, newspaper. The yeah, and the newspaper yes. would absorb any moisture and putting it in the dark as well, avoiding the sun and also lots of air around it. So, yeah, that's. that's uh, so you could leave a surprise at anyone's house and you <laughs> stay with them for a couple of uh, weeks and you could. don't tell them. Maybe okay. a year later. Yeah, they could just. Look in drawer three of your cupboard <laughs> and you might find something special. Yeah. <laughs> Coast FM, the gardening gang with Pete Little and Cheryl and Darcy, the most popular radio program here on a Saturday morning. You know that? The research says. I saw People that. love it. I know. But we are just not going to stay on our laurels. We're talking to Ruth Donnelly this morning from Coachwood Nurseries. Good morning, Ruth. Good morning, everyone. Ruth, the reason I've got you on the show today is because we're talking about dried flowers and botanicals. And I was up at your nursery a few months ago and I was astounded at the way you have diversified with your business. So can you just explain uh, for our listeners at the moment what you're doing up there at Coachwood? It's a bit different than other places. You know, in my early days, uh, dried flowers were so popular and they were the rage, you know, doing things with making craft things and things for your home, using dried flowers with wood and driftwood and lots of arrangements with dried flowers and they have come right back in and they're becoming so popular. And we're so lucky to have you here on the coast doing it as well. So what's your direct experience with the floristry trade? I did a course at Gosford TAFE probably nearly 40 years ago now a great course. I did it at the same time or a similar time to a horticultural course at the Wright School of Horticulture. So I've got both training um, as a florist as well as as a horticulturalist. So I'm doing now what I did many years ago and it's so exciting because it's another aspect to horticulture that anyone can do and anyone can enjoy. So you can collect plants from your own garden and you can dry them and there's different techniques and different things, how you method, different methods, how you dry them and then arrange them and they're preserved for years. 
And they look very different. I think today's dried flower arrangements, and this is what we've been talking about today on the Gardening Gang, they look very different than a sort of great-grandmother's uh, dusty little collection in a vase. <laughs> 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 they're, uh, yes, they're always yes. dusty, weren't they? <laughs> no one really appreciated yeah. them. Mm. Yeah, well, actually, if they're well-preserved, you can take them outside, hose them down. If they get a little bit of dust on them, hang them up to dry on a hot day and they're as good as gold. So, Ruth, what created the renewed interest in dried flowers, you think? I just think it's another generation that doesn't have that much time to have fresh flowers every week in their home. There's a lot okay. of holiday homes. Mm-hmm. A lot of holiday homes where people want to have some nature inside their home, but they can leave it there and then it looks great. And wall hangings, it's another form of artwork. Oh, yes, where... that's what it's been uh, in my experience, the wall art, yes. Ruth, is there a uh, like a showroom at your business there for people to look through? Look through, or uh, is it uh, purely online? I mean, I'm not quite sure. No, no, but it's it's mainly here. In fact, when you drive down into our nursery on the left hand side, there's a pale blue building. It's the size of a small house, and it's absolutely chock a block full of hundreds of different types of dried oh. flowers and foliage. Mm. So it's quite inspiring when you walk in and it's got this amazing aroma. I've been there, Pete, and it's amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, oh, I, yeah really. <laughs> I actually came really? home with a, a big armful of them because I was just like, yeah, I was, oh, they're gorgeous. And some of the things that you also provide there, I've noticed some beautiful bases as well from driftwood and uh, barbed wire and really inspiring and interesting things. But you also teach people in the area, as you said, to collect their own things and show them how to dry things too, don't you? Yes, yeah, so the short course that we do is just usually on a Sunday afternoon once a month and it's only two hours and it covers the whole, every aspect of drying and preserving flowers and foliage and then you get to make some lovely posies and wreaths and beautiful things. You can use, yeah, you can use the little posies for gifts and that sort of thing and mm-hmm. um, so they're great. They're very versatile. Oh, look, thank you so much for being with us on The Gardening Gang today. You know, Ruth is a true local. 42 years ago, she learned at Gosford, maybe it was the the, the tech college in those days. I'm not quite sure if it was called TAFE in those days. I remember um, the old place well. (laughs) <laughs> yes, it, it's near Gosford Courthouse. Fabulous, Ruth. Okay, well, thanks for your time, mate. Another local on the radio this morning. Unlike uh, yeah, Sheldon my... and myself, we were imports. We mate. were yeah. imports. We're locals now, though. Thanks, <laughs> Ruth. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks Thank for your you. time. Bye. There's Ruth Dunley Bye. there from the Coachwood Nursery. And we're talking about those everlasting flowers today in the gardening gang. We're talking about the opportunities for you to get right into this whole new craze, the dried flowered craze. And I've got a question all about obtaining those flowers that someone whispered in my shell-like ear, Sherilyn. Mm-hmm. Pete Little and Sherilyn Darcy, just to sort of catch those who may not know what we're doing here today. And uh, it, the question was all about obtaining stock from public areas. <laughs> now, can I just sort of breeze through the uh, forest and of tranquility somewhere and just uh, take a, a little cutting? Would that be permissible, you think? It's it's going... Oh, sorry. <coughs> sorry. Oh, come on, back to me. Come on. Hang on. Sorry, Pete. Um, look, it's going to depend on what the foliage is is that's it because if some things are protected and some are threatened and some are from threatened uh, ecological communities it's very complicated the laws about picking up things in the forest and on public land in australia you would think it's just a blanket thing but it's not it's actually different in every state no it's very very different and you have to be careful with it now there's protected as i said there's some things that are protected some that are threatened some that are in ecological communities and these are all all listed on environment.newsouthwales.gov.au. So you need to be careful about what you collect. Now, our council has different laws as well. Now, it all those things, okay, that's what happens. And look, just using your common sense, waratahs, flannel flowers, no, okay? And... Uh, oh. Oh, no. nice. grow, your, grow, grow your own. <laughs> That's it. Or go and see Ruth. She might have something that you might be able mm. to pick up. There you go. Or uh, other florists and other places like that. Okay. Now, just as you said, just wandering through the forest, I see a nice tree, a stick, a seed pod. Those things look lovely in these arrangements. It's a really tricky situation. Okay. If 
if a ranger or whoever sees you says, well, this is an ecological community that I think is threatened, you can't pick that one leaf up, yeah, you could be fined for that. Okay. Has anybody, to your knowledge, been actually <laughs> taken to court around here? Uh, someone has been, yeah. That really? was a couple of years ago. That was actually straight out flannel flowers picked from the side of the railroad tracks, and I think people saw her doing it and had arms. Oh, so it wasn't in the forest at all? No, she was area. actually... We well, see the flannel flowers come up everywhere around yes. here because it's, it's where they're, they're endemic to this area. And, oh, yes, yeah, she went to she went to court and she was fined and, <laughs> yeah, big heavy fines for that, so a big no-no. Now, the other thing about the Central Coast is, and this is another interesting... Well, we have interesting uh, legislation in this area. The other thing is, is it an act of vandalism? And that is to be determined by the Central Coast Council. Now, where we can say ring barking a tree, you know, scribing our names in it or being horrible with spray paint or something like that, that's vandalism. But so could just picking up a branch that's fallen because you're changing the the nature of where you are. Now, of course, you're going to have to be incredibly officious to sort of go, right, that's it, you're getting fined. But I'd just be careful. Uh, The other thing is you you don't want to go in and completely decimate an area and take armfuls of bracken and all these things because that plant life and that fallen foliage and, and plants and all those sorts of things are there to... You look after the soil as well. So there is a, there's oh, yeah. a good thing. So if you decide, you know, you're going to set up Pete's Dried Flower and Foliage Emporium up there opposite <laughs> Ruth at Summersby and go into competition and you go down to, I don't know, one of the public land spaces and go, right, I'm coming down there with my, my big truck and I'm just going to clear out this whole area, that's changing the ecological balance of the area. So that's what it is. Now, I would say picking up the odd you know, interesting fallen seed pod or branch or something, you're going to be okay. All or right? dried leaf. Or dried leaf. But, look, you can't say Cheryl and Darcy at the Gardening Gang said it was okay. Right? <laughs> it's not a defence. It's not a defence. But definitely that those Australian native flowers, it, don't don't start picking them and uh, you will be in trouble because people have been fined. And, and also it's not a good thing to do. They, they are protected for a reason. Okay, we'll have a segment each week here uh, called, uh, you know, Flowers and you, the legal issues with flowers. That's going to be a whole new segment for our program. Yeah. I'm just joking, actually. <laughs> it's common sense, isn't it? Yes, it is. But some yeah. of those things you mentioned there, I had no idea of the uh, difficulties in uh, just yeah. knocking things off, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> just going, pluck. <laughs> Maybe from your neighbourhood no. garden, that might be safer. Oh, that's or grow right? your own, Pete. Grow your own. <laughs> oh, or grow your own. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Coast FM. It's the gardening gang. And here's Coast FM 963 with the classic hits. This is The Gardening Gang with Pete and Sherilyn, now joined by one of your friends in the industry that uh, mm. I believe has a MC in his name. What's it his name? is. MC Microbe is joining us again this morning. I think we're going to keep him regularly because we've had a lot of emails and phone calls and letters saying we love MC. MC, good morning to you. Have you really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, she's a bit of a fibber. We've had one. (laughs) (laughs) You've had one. That's good enough for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Woody's dad. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Mum and Dad. (laughs) And your tips this week, MC. I love MC Microbes tips. What's your tip this week? Well, we're coming into autumn now, and a big thing at the moment, as you've told me, Sherilyn, is leaf mould. It's all the hot goss. It's it is. gardening gold. It's soil improver. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's leaves left to rot down over time. And make, yeah, yeah like make a... Exactly, yeah. So you can use this for mulching, um, oh. in potting mix, in seed raising mix, a whole bag of things, which pretty much you just collect this excess of leaf litter, put it in a bag, put some holes in it, and just leave it for a couple of years and it'll turn into something great. A couple of years? Yes, well, patience pays off, Pete. <laughs> Is that why you call it uh, gardening gold? Because it takes that long to find? (laughs) That's it. If you're in the right place, you might find a whole bunch of it. Who knows? Planning. It's really fantastic. Thank you, MC. MC Uh, Microbe, who joins us every Saturday morning here at Coast FM's Gardening Gang. Sherwin, let's move forward. Let's do that. With more of those classic hits this morning. And this is the Gardening Gang, heard every Saturday morning. Mm. Every Saturday morning, including next Saturday, with no break for Easter, we're here with uh, little chocolate bunnies mm. and all that kind of stuff next week. So I look forward to that one. And are you allowed to eat chocolate? Is that part of your dietary routine? I think, uh, routine? yeah. I've been looking after. I've been. I've been looking after myself, and uh, but I'm going to let myself have a couple of. 
You've been looking after yes. yourself. But I've been on a diet. I'm going to break my little... Anti-chocolate been, vibe. Yes, I am. And because I can't say no to a lint bunny. <laughs> Who can? Who well, can say no? Just send gifts. <laughs> Time to get your hands dirty in the gardening gang this afternoon. Well, this morning, I should say. <laughs> yes, it is. It is time to get your hands dirty, coasty gardeners and people in temperate areas of Australia as well because I know our podcast, Pete, is going off like a frog in a sock, as someone said to me. Uh, that's And that's you can find that at home with the Garden Gang on any place that you get podcasts for. So what can you plant this week? Well, I'm going to launch off with what can you plant to turn into dried flowers on the central coast and temperate areas of Australia. Everlasting. Casting daisies, banksia, kangaroo paw, mulla mulla, billy buttons, chamomile, roses, baby breath, immortal, or also known as curry plant, status, love in the mist, love in a mist, also known as nigella, zinnias, meadow sweet, and hydrangeas, of course, make amazing dried flowers. Moving on to the veggie patch, artichokes, Asian greens, broad beans, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrot, cauliflower, coriander, and English spinach. Spinach, just to name a few. And if you want to find out more, you can find it on the Coast FM Facebook page, Coast FM 963 Gosford, also the Gardening Gang. And you can also find it in Central Coast newspapers where you can read Down in the Garden with me. Really? Yeah. Fabulous. (laughs) And uh, that pretty well takes care of what we're classing as being... All the dirt it this is. morning, isn't it? And after the Any news... Any more dirt? No, no nothing the only, uh, scandalous well, you want well, to share no, with? No, actually, maybe it's about our listeners' dirt, Pete, because after the news, which is coming up shortly, we are going to be answering... Well, I'm going to be answering your gardening questions. So if you've got a question that you'd like to throw to me and see if I can be stumped, or if you'd like to ask Pete as well, I'd like to see that. <laughs> uh, when you hear the bell after the news... or no. Even now you can do it. Uh, 432-0072. And, uh, yeah, after the news, we'll answer that question. Uh, good on your teacher. and We'll talk to you then. Okay. As as our Gardening Gang School of the Radio. Now, let's get the bell out because it is time for the Coast FM Gardening School with Sherlyn. Yes. And uh, you've got a couple of uh, very interesting inquiries this morning that you'd like to answer in the gardening school today. I have, everybody. Sit up straight. Gardening school has started and I've got a few emails and I'm going to read out one that's very, very interesting and it's probably affecting a lot of people at the moment on the coast and everywhere. And if it's not affecting you, it probably will because of all of this rain and then these sudden hot days. Peter Flint writes... Hello, Sherilyn. Asking for a product or a natural remedy to control or eradicate rust spores on frangipanis. Regards, Peter Flint. Thank you for your email, Peter, and for listening. This is a big problem. As I said, lots of rain, humidity, sunshine and that. Because frangipani rust is a... It's a type of a pathogen. It's a a fungal pathogen. It's called Coleosporium plumeria, plumeria being the name for frangipani. So it is pretty much common for frangipanis in these areas, and it's really difficult to control. Come on, give us a solution. Come on. Okay, so... The build-up. Well, the build-up is like... I'm I'm setting the scene for you because it is a horrible thing. Now, because it's a fungus, we need to be really careful with the way we get rid of things because anything that those leaves touch, it looks like like it sounds like like a rust, like a, a ready sort of powdery thing on the leaves usually and sometimes on the branches as well. You need to get rid of those leaves, preferably burn them or or fold them all up and put them in your regular garbage bin. Anything that it touches because it's a fungus, it's kind of like, you know, like athlete's foot or something for humans. It just spreads everywhere. Ooh. Yeah. Well, think of it like coronavirus for, for mm. plants. So you just can't, and even your hands, your gloves, your cutting tools, everything, it would just spread it to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. First of all, with your plants, you've got to make sure that they're in a very uh, airy sort of position. So if your frangipanis are sort of like, you know, with lots of other plants or close to it, it's always going to be a problem if you've got it for the first time. So very easy to move frangipanis. You just pull them up and move them. They, they're fine with it. Also, um, don't water... I know it's hard, so much rain, but don't water the leaves. Never water the leaves or the stems of frangipanis. Never, ever do that. Always water the ground. So you don't want water hanging around because that, they, you know, this pathogen loves it as well. Mm-hmm. Now, there are toxic things, you're right, Peter, that you can get. They're not good for you or the environment because we like to save the planet. 
what you can try, and it is hard to get rid of, I'm so sorry, but once you've got rid of all the leaves, you pull them off, the things that are that are there. But the thing is that frangipani rust, here's a good thing, it's not going to kill your plant. It just looks revolting, that's all. But a good way is white oil, homemade white oil. And I'm going to give you the recipe for this, and I will put it up on our Facebook page as well, Coast FM 963 Gosford, for you as well. So what you need to do is add two cups of sunflower oil, don't use anything else, with um, about half a cup of organic washing up liquid. Make sure it's something that's organic. Give it a really good shake, okay? This will last about uh, three to four months and you dilute it then to big sort of tablespoons per litre of water. Shake that up and spray it all over your plant. That's a good way to do it. Now, I have heard that baking soda, bicarbonate soda works well mixed up in water as well. I'd be testing that on an inconspicuous pl- part of your plant because it's just, that's just changing the acidity of the area so that it can get rid of it. I, I've not tried it, so I don't really want to recommend it, but I have tr- made my own uh, white oil and I have used that okay um with some success so i hope that helps peter let us know how you go but look you're not going to lose your french pennies okay it just looks unsightly and maybe with a bit more of this drying air it might be better i have one more question for the teacher today and this is brought to mind by the fact that uh i got roused on by my wife for using wd-40 to kill that growth between our (laughs) pavers and uh (laughs) she said well you can ask sherilyn what might be a nice natural way because oh, they you know all this rain and the moisture yeah. it brought all this weeds back up again they don't normally occur this time of year mm-hmm. so what do i do between the pavers come on tell okay me. all right well between the pavers boiling water and salt i usually put some salt down you know sprinkle that down leave that on for about half an hour and then come down with the kettle with boiling water and then pull that over it it kills the roots kills the plants and just after a day you can just ease them out there you go not salt toxic. is so expensive. Oh, salt's not that. <laughs> it's cheaper than bloody WD-40. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think we're playing a Beach Boys song. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice? And Sherilyn, 25 minutes after 9 o'clock, and you've got something of uh, real interest to share with us this morning that I even don't at this stage have any idea what you're going to... But on the radio, I hope it's nice. Oh, it's I hope it's going to be uh, of, of uh, broadcast quality. It, it is and, broadcast and tasteful. Quality. Yes, yes, it is. This okay. is our regular feature, Amazing Plant Facts You Might Not Know, with me. Uh, this has been a popular little segment. And I actually invite our listeners to email us at gardening central coast at gmail.com if you've got an amazing plant story you'd like me to investigate or you've got one that you know and uh, i'll talk about it on air for you but this week this is a good one for pete he's drinking he's sipping his tea so don't splutter it everywhere beautiful do you talk to your plants no well you should because they've proved that plants are telepathic Okay, fill me in. Okay. (laughs) And this goes back to the 1960s. A scientist by the name of Cleve Baxter attached a plant to a polygraph machine and this has been repeated numerous times over the years. And when he threatened to hurt the plant, the polygraph went practically crazy. Another experiment had two plants placed in the same room with only one connected to the polygraph machine. And then a group of men entered this room and one man was asked to harm the unconnected plant. The polygraph plant began to display movement on the instrument's instrument's readouts. The men left the room and returned some time later. When the man who had harmed the other plant entered without touching any plants, the polygraph plant started showing activity. This has been repeated many times. The plant remembered who harmed them. Well, Well, it just goes to show you. (laughs) Don't threaten your plants. Don't threaten your plants. It's proven. And talking to them makes them better. So they have proved it. Has a plant, to your knowledge, ever killed anybody? Like, uh, is oh, apart from poisoning, there'd be no sort of situations where it's kind of wrapped itself around you and squeezed. Only snakes oh, do that, don't no, they? No, I think you were thinking of the Triffids, the Day of the Triffids. That's, That's one I'm of my favourite of. stories. Yeah, yeah. Oh. no, not really. But there are there are really fast-growing plants in the Amazon that people have fallen asleep and, you know, bits have actually gone into them. And, uh, yeah, not, not, not in the science fiction way of, like, wrapping all the way around. But, yeah, they can – and spores of mushrooms and, you know, all those things. Ah, uh, the power of the plant. Yeah, love it.
And Vicky's on the line right now. Vicky from Narara Valley Nursery with What's Hot and What's Not. Good morning to you, Vicky. Good morning, Vicky. Good morning, gardening gang. I love starting my weekend with you guys. Well, why is that? What gives you the uh, what gives you the greatest buzz? Talking to me or Sherilyn? There you go. I think both. Thanks what nice. happy people to start your Saturday morning off with? Yay! Okay. <laughs> All right. What's hot in the nursery it. world at the moment, Vicky? Hot in the garden centre since I've been listening to the radio show this morning is your native and your ornamental grasses. So I'm thinking that the uh, lamandra tanikas, which are a nice little dwarf lamandra. They're mm. awesome, tough little grasses for any kind of spot in the garden. And also, you can dry them out for your floral arrangement. Very good. Oh, so good idea. Also, in your ornamentals, we've got your penicetums or your purple fountain grasses with the little fluffy flower spikes, which are very nice and cute, and they also make beautiful oh, dried floral arrangements. They do, Vicky. You're right on. They, That's right. They do. Then mm. they're so nice in the garden. They're just gorgeous colour and, mm. yeah, and just... Very hardy too. Mm, that's good. So we're talking about these uh, dried flowers. How would you handle a, a uh, as someone who came into your nursery and started plucking leaves off and to take home and dry? Would you would you approach them in a nice way or take an axe to them? <laughs> I'd, I'd quietly go up to Brad and tell him about it and he can deal with it and I'll stand behind him. Leave it to the boss. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a temptation there to, uh, you know, follow up on some of Sherilyn's oh. ideas. And say, oh, we did have a naughty cool. little villain in the garden centre that took a little cutting off a very expensive plant a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> we won't get into that one now, though. Caught we'll keep on it on camera, huh? No. <laughs> well, it is yes, shoplifting. On camera. No, it's shoplifting. You shouldn't do it. It's very naughty. That's it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that's why it's hot around the garden and or the nurseries. So what uh, is... Have you given us the oh, hot deal at Narara Valley today? So Since... today I wanted to let you all know that I did a cute little herbal tea display here. Mm. And I've got on display beautiful herbs from Renaissance Herbs. Um, oh. We've got your lemon balms. We've got chamomile, holy basil, stevia, which is a natural sweetener, spearmint, echinacea, and they all make beautiful herbal teas, which would be really nice now that the weather is cooling down. So we're opening a cafe on the weekend, are we, as well there? Yeah. Your own little personal cafe. Coffee bar there, but now it's going to go for herbal teas. I like it. Yes. Well, you buy your own herbs and you grow them and then you cut them and you eat them and you drink them. Wonderful Mm. idea. Now, holy foliage, what's uh, not so hot at the moment? So, not so holy foliage is um, during COVID, there was a big rush on buying your indoor plants, which included a lot of tropical plants. So, a lot of money went on your tropicals. So, now's about the time that the weather's cooling down that you want to go and um, make sure that you can keep your plants nice and warm so they're in a cool spot. Bring them inside into the warmest room that you have. Uh, watch your watering, slow down on your watering and check them over for pests because most pests on indoor plants can be treated nicely and uh, environmentally friendly with a nice white oil or pest oil. Yes. Lovely idea. That's really Thank good. Thank you so much for that, Vicky. Okay. You're very well, welcome. You have a pleasant week and I hope things are drying out there in the nursery because they were uh, certainly around Narara, the suburb there, knocked around by these uh, heavy, heavy water um, yes. in the creek there, weren't they? They certainly were, and I'm telling you, it's just the perfect autumn morning here today. It's so beautiful. It's a nice day to be out. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Vicky. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you with the holy foliage. We'll check you next week. Holy (laughs) foliage. Bye for now. See you later, guys. Bye. Coast FM, it's the Gardening Gang. Saturday morning between 8 and 10 with Pete Little and Cheryl and Darcy, now joined by Lachlan McDonald from uh, Ray White McDonald Partners. Now, Lachlan, good morning to you. We missed you last week, mate. You've been, you've been a busy boy on the auction scene. I have been. Or been you very washed busy. away last week. A bit of both. <laughs> well, it's a lovely weekend coming up on the coast. And I thought today we'd talk about the opportunities that are arising for the senior sits on the Central Coast. If they were to sell their properties, because many people are finding that their houses and their, uh, well, their, their more so than the units, I think, but their houses are selling for a lot more than they were maybe 12 months ago. Now, how can they maximise the profit if they decide to sell? Well, it's the, the age-old thing that we get asked, you know, okay, well, that's great. Property's gone up in value, but 
where do we go? Everything else has as well. I think the downsizers are in a really good position, though, because the freestanding homes, they are performing so much more strongly than any other bracket in the market because all the demand's coming from Sydney, remember, guys? So these are people in apartments and smaller properties. They want land. They want a house. They're not interested in, in they a villa. They, they, they want a garden, don't they? They want a garden. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Pets, kids, whatever it may be, mm-hmm. they don't want a villa or something like that. They've probably come from a similarly sized place in Sydney. So if you're selling a house, then chances are the price rises that you've seen on your house, the same level of increase won't have happened on the villa or maybe the apartment that you're looking to buy. So a downsizer would be classed as a person who goes from a large property down to a home unit or a villa. Is that the term that they use, a downsizer? Yeah, that's it, yeah, yeah. If they're going from a large home and trying to still stay in a home but a smaller home, they're not going to see any gain there because that smaller home market is the most active with all the first home buyers, so it's very competitive. You have to be going from a house into a villa or townhouse or perhaps apartment to maximise that financial benefit. Are you seeing that on a regular basis now on the coast or is it just emerging in the last couple of months? Well, it's always been the case to some degree, but we've seen it amplified as the price gains continue. Now, the housing market on the coast, of course, uh, does stretch from homes that uh, may well be 500000 up to $5 million, I suppose. Yeah, there are some. What, what, what are the areas that people are uh, from Sydney looking to buy? Is it sort of sitting at that million mark or is it less than that? Yeah, there's really two categories. There's the ones that have a good income, they've got a good budget, let's say up to maybe one and a half million. But in Sydney, that doesn't buy them in a lot of the areas they're coming from, a freestanding house. Mm. So that's one segment. But then there's also the lifestyle buyers. Now, these are the people that are selling out of Sydney, pocketing cash and coming up here and trying to buy something like an acreage or a waterfront. Now, they might have sold a home in Sydney for four, five, six million dollars and they come up here and they want to buy something for two or three. So there's that market as well. That's pretty pretty buoyant at the moment. And is there stock to uh, to sell them or is that a bit tight as well? Stock's very tight and that's what's driving the prices, definitely. The prices are going up, up, up and away. Uh, I've got my sister-in-law's actually uh, arriving today from Tasmania. Her and her husband are looking for a property on the Central Coast. Oh, they're Lachlan moving up. I know, Lachlan can talk you to got them. Any stock, mate? Yeah, yeah, have you got anything? But they're, I know they're looking sort of just under the million. That's yep. what they're looking at. So between the six and a million because they want to pocket some from Tassie. So what's the market like around that price if you're not quite up there? Well, that's, that's probably the most competitive part because uh, a lot of Sydney first home buyers, because remember, you've got the stamp duty exemption, but yes. there's only up to around the 650 mark. But a lot of people then, they don't mind going further mm-hmm. because you only pay stamp duty on that extra part. Right. So okay. a lot of Sydney first home buyers will still spend eight, nine, okay, thousand. Yeah. So it's a very um, competitive part of the market. So they're in for a fight. They are in for a fight. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Okay. Let the fight begin, and the real estate agents and the vendors are our winners. I think. Yeah. Mm. Lachlan, thanks for your time. We'll catch you next week. Oh, it's the Easter weekend. You're going away. We'll talk to you next week, won't we? We will. Okay. Great stuff. Thanks, Lachlan. Lachlan McDonald from Ray White McDonald Partners here on the coast. Talks to us every week on The Gardening Gang. And Val from Jeffrey Road at Chittaway Point was on the line and she didn't feel comfortable about going live to Air Sherland. So yeah. she did want to say thank you to the Terrigal Trojan rugby players. Fifteen of these boys came along and uh, shoveled all this debris from her house and her lot that came down the river that's during wonderful. the floods. And that's lovely, guys. Thanks so much. And uh, she just wants to say she appreciates it. To the Trojans. Thank top, you, Trojans. Top marks. Well done. Thanks, well boys. done, boys. Now, Sherilyn, let's yes. look and see what's going to be on the show next week, our Easter weekend. It's our Easter weekend. We're going to go real healthy because we probably need to be a bit healthy. So no, we're going... We're going to be really naughty. <laughs> <those chocolate. laughs> well, this is to sort of balance out the naughty, okay? Different sort of like little round Easter egg. Brassicas. We're talking brassicas, everybody. So that's your broccoli, your cabbages, cauliflower, kale, and also Brussels sprouts. 
They look a little mm. bit like Easter eggs. So we'll be talking... This is the time to start planting them. So we'll, we'll be talking about planting them in your garden, using them, cooking with them, all those sorts of things. Save up your brassica questions for us because we love having a chat with people on air. And and also your tips. If you've got a tip about brassicas and the way you grow them in Central Coast and temperate areas, please let us know. Gardeningcentralcoast at gmail.com. Well, there we go. Wonderful program next week. Nothing yes. to do with Easter eggs. <laughs> Nothing to do with the significance <laughs> and <laughs> all that of the... Uh, of that uh, sort of holy season, but we might talk about it a little bit. We might talk. There are Easter flowers. We might. I'll. I'll throw that in for you, Pete. How's that? A little segment. An Easter flower. Easter flower. Okay. Easter lilies. We'll I talk about them. All, All right. right. In the meantime, oh, have a good week, and uh, enjoy the radio station because we've got the weekend beat coming up after the news at ten this morning. And thank you to our sponsors also too for their support of our program, which is the Gardening Gang. Alan Graham's Caravans and RVs at Wyoming open all this weekend and also Doormaster Security Doors and Windows.